Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all this morning. Uh, please stand as you are able for number 374 in the blue hymnals, Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God. And while we're standing on those promises, why don't we say good morning to each other, share with each other the peace of Christ. As the kids come forward, ring bells this morning. Come on up, guys.
I gotta be careful, I might be roadkill, I try to walk past this too slow here. <laughs> well, praise be to God for our children's bell choir. Can I get an amen? Thank you all so much. I greet you in the name, the peace, and the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I gotta tell you, it's kind of funny. At the 8 a.m. service, most people show up at the last minute, okay? They, they, they do whatever, and they show up. And about 7.30 this morning, because it was so bright and sunny, people are coming in, and talking, and smiling, and laughing, because the sun's out, and it's all bright, and I thought it was so funny, because about 7.45, everybody was ready for service. <laughs> I was like, well, you guys are a little early. <laughs> but um, I'm thankful that you all are here, and I hope you feel that same joy. Um, with the sun and the brightness and such a mellow January. I don't know if we'll pay for it later, if what the Lord has in store, but for today, we'll enjoy the blessing of this Sunday. Amen? I want to greet you in the name of the peace and the Lord, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you haven't already, would you please pull this yellow to bulletin, yellow card out of your bulletin? And if you would, fill out the information. If you come here all the time, just put your first name down. If you're new or a guest, thank you. God bless you. You're a gift to this congregation. Please fill out the visitor information there. On the back, you see a place for prayer requests. Remember to circle the word yes or no, because if you write a prayer request and you circle yes, that prayer request will go out to others via email. If you circle no, it comes to my desk and my desk alone, and I pray for it and I rip it up. There will also be a place for you to write an answer to a question about the sermon uh, and while I play a song by the City Harmonic today. And um, if you would like to, uh, if you want to see those answers, they're no longer in your bulletin. We're going to save a few thousand dollars the way we're doing the bulletin now. So we want to keep that that way. So the questions and answers will be in the announcement slides as you walk into church. You can also find them on email and on Facebook. And if you wouldn't mind holding onto this card until the ushers come forward for the presentation of our tithes and offerings, and put this in along with your generous tithe and donation to Christ United Methodist Church. Now, this is the last Sunday you can sign up for the pie auction. Again, this is how it's going to work. The contestants will make two pies, two of the exact same pie. One, we will take little spoons in a cup and hand out bites of so people can taste test it after the Sunday service, after the 1015 service next week. And the other pie goes up for auction. So after the 1015 service next week, we're going to go down to the fellowship hall and there's going to be pie. Okay? Um, I'd appreciate if you came to the service, though you might imagine there's a number of people that will say, skip the sermon, I want just the pie. Okay? But after the 1015 service, we'll go down there, there'll be coffee, there'll be milk. And after you're done tasting, we're going to auction each pie off. And the pie that gets the highest bid it's the Pie in the Sky Award. There you go. You guys figured it out. now. only took four weeks. Anyways, so um, th that's something that's going to go to support the ministry of making disciples of Jesus Christ here at Christ United Methodist Church. Also, youth group today will be at 3.30 to 5 because we want everybody home for the big game. So if you know a youth or uh, if there's any youth here today, uh, 3.30 to 5 today so you can get home and watch the 49ers and the Chiefs. Um, people have asked who I'm picking. I'm not picking anybody. I'm just hoping for a good game because if the Packers are in it, I really don't care. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, is there anything else in regards to the life of the church I'm neglected to mention or anybody has a question about? If not, let's take a moment of silence and prepare for a time of prayer with our Almighty God. Almighty God, there are a number of things to lift up in our church, and um, I've been given permission by the family to lift up the fact that Sarah Walter um, on Friday was in Blaine Farm and Fleet and had a spell, um, and she fell, not fell, but went to the floor, and that her son had to call the ambulance and come and get her. Uh, she is home resting, but we pray for her, but not only that happened, but then on Saturday, her son Nick had to have an emergency appendectomy. So the Walter family has been through a lot, quite a lot this weekend. So I want to just take a moment and ask you, Lord, to bless that family, bless Sarah's recovery, bring her to us, bless Nick's recovery. I heard that the surgery and everything went well. Just watch over that family in the rough weekend that we've had. We ask this in your name, Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Those of you that know Ed Pertel know that he's been dealing with shingles for, what, two months, Lori? Where is she? Two months he's been dealing with shingles, and it's not getting better. He's still in dire pain. And Lord God, we just pray, if you would, would you just put your hand on his head and take those away? Or give the doctors and the medical team something to ease the pain, something to make this better so he can go on with his life. Bless him, Lord. Bless Lori and everything they've gone through with this terrible virus. We ask this in your name, Lord. 
Lord, hear our prayers. Um, Lord God, I also want to pray for, and today it's not apropos because everybody comes in here happy and smiling because it's so sunny, but I've noticed in the, in the last few months an uptake in the amount of people that are fighting with each other, that are arguing with each other. The more we as human beings seem to be splitting apart. And I just pray, Lord God, that we as your church could allow your Holy Spirit to come into us and to allow nothing that would make us look at another human being and belittle them or put them down. I would pray that we would be a model for peace and for reconciliation and for respect and human dignity. Please, Lord, intervene in this world and let us as human beings come back together. Let us heal. Let us love on each other. And that there's nothing that, Lord God, that your children, when they come together around you, cannot solve or conquer. We ask this in your name, Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Is there anyone else who wants to lift up something to the Lord this morning? Yes, Bonnie. We have a family at Lebanon, um, the Buckman family. They oh, lost yeah. Their yeah. Lord God, we lift up the Buckman family. Uh, Sue, I believe, is the wife's name. Is that correct? Sue Buckman? Uh, Ellie's the child. Um, Lord God, that we prayed for them last week. Um, they have a, Lord, they lost their father, and there's young children, and a mom that now is facing raising them the rest of the way on their own. So we pray, Lord God, that the community and their faith community surrounds them and blesses them, and thank you for taking care of their father in heaven. We ask this in your name, Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Did I see another hand up over here? Rosie. Um, I thought there was George, Butch, what I call him. You call him Butch, okay. He's at Meritor Hospital. He's they thought at first he had lung cancer. Thankfully, he doesn't have that. He's had, uh, they're draining fluid off his lungs. Okay. Uh, he's getting better. So there's fluid surrounding his lungs and making it hard to breathe. Can we pray for your foot too? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Almighty God, we pray for Rosie's brother, George. She calls him Butch. Um, he doesn't have lung cancer. Praise God for that. But he's got this fluid around his lungs, and they're constantly kind of having to drain it so that he can breathe. And we pray, Lord, you'd give him relief. Let that fluid go away and his lungs would be better. And we also pray for Rosie's continued recovery with her foot. We ask this in your name, Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Anyone else this morning? Yes, Jan. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. Lord God, we lift up Marilyn's son and grandson. They're the ones killed in that terrible accident in Cambridge a couple of weeks ago. Jan knows her and just wants to pray for her. And, you know, Lord, we watch this stuff on media or on television, and then we pray for it and it goes away. But it doesn't go away for those that are dealing with it. And so we pray, Lord, for what they're dealing with, and we pray they're surrounded by your love, grace, and your chosen children that are to usher them through this time. We ask this in your name, Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Anyone else this morning? If not, why don't we take a moment and just pray to God about things we want to keep just between him and us. For all those things we've lifted up privately, Lord, we ask this in your name, Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Almighty God, I'm struck by how many people in this day and age want to do things by themselves. They don't ask for help. They don't want anybody to know what they're going through. And I'm so glad, Lord, in this sanctuary, it lives up to its name that people feel safe enough and loved enough that they lift all these things up to you. And we know you hear us, Lord. And we know your desire is for all of us to speak to you, to come to you, to lean on you, and not to try to tackle any of this alone anymore. 
Because together with you, nothing is impossible and everything is possible. Which is why your son Jesus Christ gave us these words. For us to come together around and pray together to remember that we're all in this together with you. Join me in praying, brothers and sisters, as it's written on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, I believe Jacob is going to lead us in a new hymn that's got a familiar melody. So the words will be new, but the melody will be familiar to you. Great. <laughs> All right. Please stand as you are able for number 3150 in your green books. Father, we have heard you calling. Over 4,000 years ago, 
In Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 through 23, Abram, who God would later rename Abraham, returns to his home in the land of Canaan victorious. A group of warlord kings had banded together to plunder the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. This had not directly impacted Abraham. However, they took his nephew Lot captive. Thus, Abraham and his men, by the will and power of God, intervened, taking back not only his nephew, but all the captives and all the spoils they had stolen. On their way through a valley to return the people and goods, Abraham is met by the priest king, Melchizedek of Salem, who worshipped God. His name means peace, and Salem would later be known as Jerusalem. Melchizedek offers bread, wine, and a blessing to and from God for the peace Abraham has brought to the region. That Does that sound familiar to anybody? Abraham then gives him a tithe, a tenth of everything he has. Now the king of Sodom also comes out to meet Abraham, offering him to keep all the spoils and only return the captives. Abraham informs him that God has said not to take anything from him to make sure he doesn't owe him any favors. Abraham chooses God over the world. 500 years later, a man named Moses, called by God to lead the Hebrews, the descendants of Abraham, out of their slavery in Egypt, climbs Mount Sinai to accept a covenant from God. For them, the Hebrews, is God's chosen people to reveal him and his love to the world within the promised land of Canaan. Part of that covenant is a set of instructions for worship where Moses' brother Aaron and his descendants would serve as high priests representing the Hebrews before God for generations to come. And one of the duties of a high priest, assisted by the Levites or descendants of Levi, was to offer blood and burnt sacrifices of valuable livestock and grain that was perfect and without blemish for both his own, the high priest's sins, as well as the sins of the chosen people of Israel. Today, we continue to read and explore this third part of an epistle or letter by an unknown Christian author to a faith community of Messianic Hebrews 2,000 years ago, who still practiced that original covenant from Moses of the Old Testament, but who also accepted Jesus as the Christ, as not only the fulfillment of that original covenant, but a new covenant offered out of God's love in the gospel. It was part of a plan. Started right after we first sinned back in the Garden of Eden and fell away from God. A plan to bring all of us back into communion with him and his eternal kingdom, now and forever. This week, the author takes who Jesus really is from the first part of this series and combines it with God's promise of a land and a rest from last Sunday to reveal to them then and us now that Jesus is not only the Christ or the Messiah, but is the new high priest of all God's children in this world starting with Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides from the spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked, and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then we have a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without 
sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace in the help of time of need. One thing we have forever tried and failed at as human beings is to hide our sin from God. God is all-knowing. Not one thought, not one word, not one action within any of us is hidden from him. Whether we acknowledge it or try to justify or ignore it, God knows it's a sin. And just like any offense in an interpersonal relationship, that sin, that sin has the potential to become an obstacle to and has the potential to destroy our relationship with God. Thus, sin must be dealt with and answered for. And just as God called Melchizedek to be a priest for Abraham, and then Aaron and his bloodline to be a high priest to the Hebrews in the Old Testament, God has made Jesus Christ the new high priest of all, who out of the greatest act and notion of love ever conceived, not only offered himself as a perfect and divine living sacrifice, having not sinned himself and being divine, but also calls us to join him in a new priesthood. Chapter 5, verse 1. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. We often mistaken someone called to do God's work as being above others. Now, I know I'm physically above all of you, being seven foot two. However, priests, and therefore pastors, although they are set apart as spiritual leaders, were never meant to be above nor below anyone else. They are called by God to serve others with loving empathy and understanding as a sinful human being in need of God themselves so as to be able to guide them and represent them before God. Continuing in chapter 5, verse 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation For all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. There is no greater example of a priest or perhaps a pastor than Jesus Christ. No greater example. As we spoke about during the first Sunday of this series, Jesus is begotten from God, not made or born as the author quotes from the second Psalm, verse 7. But conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit as God in the flesh, the Son of God who came out of a divine, unconditional love, despite our consistent and constant sinful rebellion against God and his kingdom, to not only live with and like us, not only to serve us by providing an example of how to deal with and resist every temptation and sin in life. Not only to die for us, but to serve us. 
with loving empathy and understanding as a new high priest from the original line of Melchizedek, as stated in Psalm 110.4. Sacrificing his own body and blood as the perfect, an ultimate sacrifice for all of our sin in order to offer us all the same promise of rest from the Old Testament. Now and forever in the promised land of heaven, the kingdom of God, as we discussed last week. Continuing in chapter 5, verse 11. About this we have much to say that is hard to explain, since you have become dull in understanding. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic elements of the oracles of God. For everyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is unskilled in the word of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, but those whose faculties have been trained by practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us go on toward perfection leaving behind the basic teaching about Christ and not laying again the foundation, repentance from dead works and faith toward God, instruction about baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And we will do this, if God permits. For it is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away. Since on their own they are crucifying again the Son of God and are holding him up to contempt. Ground that drinks up the rain falling on it repeatedly, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it produces thorns and thistles... It is worthless, and on the verge of being cursed, its end is to be burned over. The author believes that these Messianic Hebrews or Jews should be priests. They should be mature Christians, desiring and teaching spiritual sustenance, solid food from God and their faith community in order to reveal who Jesus is to others and how that should impact life and the life of the church. Instead, he says, they are acting like babies. Did you pick that up? Babies who need to be taught the basics all over again. As a baby desires milk. Because their faith is such that they cannot even comprehend what God sees as good or evil. And the author is telling them then, and perhaps to some extent to us now, grow up. Grow up. Stop making excuses and putting limits on ourselves, saying, oh, I'm only human. Or that's just the way the world is. Instead, let us strive for perfection in a relationship with God and in living according to his will in life and in church. Yes, Jesus loves us and calls us to him and his church the way we are right now. But one of the first things we should discover as part of our faith is that also out of his love for us, God doesn't want us to stay the way we are. He wants us to repent of all that sin we've been trying to hide or justify. To reset our priorities around Jesus as our new high priest and our life around his pattern. How is a new priesthood We are to be inviting others to be baptized into the church and into his salvation. We should be laying hands on and praying for the ill and the dying to tell others about how he not only died for our sin, but rose from the dead to save us from eternal judgment and prepare us for an eternity in heaven. Brothers and sisters, that's why they call it the good news. For it is impossible to truly have faith in the love of God and not want to change. To not want to start rejecting this world and what it has to offer. To start living life in the life of our church as part of God's calling. 
to me a new priesthood that with loving empathy and understanding meets the needs of others as well as helps to meet their spiritual need for a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. Those who claim to have faith but do not or have abandoned it commit the only unforgivable sin to see faith in, in Jesus himself as beneath them. As beneath them. For a field that is rained on by God's grace and produces a heavenly crop is pleasing to God. But a field that produces only worldly thorns and thistles will be burned. Continuing in verse 9, even though we speak in the way, beloved, we are confident of better things in your case. Things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not overlook your work and the love you have showed for his sake in serving the saints as you still do. And we want each one of you to show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope to the very end. So that you may not become sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. When God made a promise to Abraham because he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently endured, obtained the promise. Human beings, of course, swear by someone greater than themselves, and an oath given as confirmation puts an end to all dispute. Now you can tell the author is trying to take on a little more encouraging tone assuring this faith community that surely God will bless them for what they are doing and have been doing. However, they then, nor us now, should never become stagnant, never satisfied with where they were or where we are as Christians and as a church. To instead be like Abraham, who lived out his entire life based on a promise from God that his descendants, the Hebrews, would inherit the promise of God's rest as God's chosen people in God's promised land where Abraham lived in Canaan. Thus, we should too live for the promise that God has given us. That we will inherit the promise of God's rest as God's chosen people in God's promised land of heaven where Abraham is now. And just as we, even today, will attempt to prove we are telling the truth or win an argument by swearing to God, I'm not a big fan of it, but it happens. God, when he made these promises to Abraham, to Moses, and to all of us through Jesus Christ, swore by himself, proving that they will not only come true, but any arg ending any argument to the contrary for those who truly have faith and are part of the priesthood of all believers. Continuing in 6.17. In the same way when God desired to show even more clearly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it by an oath. So that through two unchangeable things in which it is impossible that God would prove false, we who have taken refuge might be strongly encouraged to seize the hope set before us. We have this hope, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner shrine behind the curtain where Jesus, a forerunner on our behalf, has entered, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Chapter 7, verse 1 this king, Melchizedek of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham as he is returning from defeating the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned one-tenth of everything. His name in the first place means king of righteousness. Next, he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. See how great he is. Even Abraham the patriarch gave him tenth of his spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to collect tithes from the people, that is, from their kindred. Though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, he's talking about Melchizedek, does not belong to their ancestry, collected tithes from Abraham. 
and blessed him who had received the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by those who are mortal, and the other by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Jesus, being both fully human and fully God, did as the high priests of the Old Testament did on the Holy Day of Atonement. Jesus went behind the curtain in the temple where the holiest of sacrifices are made, offering himself as the perfect sacrifice for all sin, as well as to offer the ultimate anchor for all the souls in this chaotic world. The confidence that through faith in Jesus' death and resurrection, we live our life and the life of our church as a priesthood of all believers. Under Jesus, inspired by the love of God, we serve our brothers and sisters in this world with the same love, empathy, and understanding Jesus has served us with representing our brothers and sisters before God like we are today by making our own sacrifice of our gifts, our own sacrifice of time, our own sacrifice of tithes, striving to give a tenth of what we make and own, and the sacrifice of our own prayers in order to be here to invest in not only our own salvation, but what we pray is the salvation of everyone in this world when Christ returns as the priesthood of all believers. If you feel called to, would you please take a moment and turn over your experience card and answer the question in the back. Heaven to us you came in love Reaching down although we turned our hearts In sacrifice you gave your son Over to death our sins to wash away in this sacrifice display all the beauty of unending love there's so much that I could say yet these simple words are rising up upon a throne of grace and in this priesthood I am one by grace restored to bow before you now for on the cross one final cry you trade Son of God for man to die Even then I know you knew my name Jesus
now to collect our tithes and offerings to go to ministry of this priesthood here at Christ United Methodist Church. Amen. Would you please stand for our doxology? Glory be to the Father. God in everything we do, whether it's praying, giving our time, worshiping, or the offering we have made on this altar, may everything be for your glory. May we always understand that your glory has never been about you being above us because you've done everything you can to bring us up to you, but that your glory is to remind us and to help inspire others of your love and come back into communion with you and your eternal kingdom now and forever. And we pray every penny that is on that altar goes to that as your priests here at Christ United Methodist Church. And all of God's children say, Amen. Please remain standing for number 3108 in the green books, Trade in My Sorrows. I'm trading my sorrows I'm trading my shame I'm laying them down For the joy of the Lord I'm trading my sickness I'm trading my pain I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. 
Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. I am pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will endure, that this joy is going to be my strength. Though the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes with the morning, yeah. I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my shame, I'm laying them down. For the joy of the Lord I'm trading my sickness I'm trading my pain I'm laying them down For the joy of the Lord I'm trading my sorrows I'm trading my shame I'm laying them down For the joy of the Lord I'm trading my sickness I'm trading my pain I'm laying them down For the joy of the Lord for the joy of the Lord, for the joy of the Lord. Lord God calls us to trade all our shame, trade all our pain, trade all our hurt in this world and all our sorrows and pick up the stole of priesthood to go into this world and offer everyone the same opportunity in a relationship through Jesus Christ. Let's go do it. And all of God's children said,